PA conference will now webinar. be recorded. And the conference will now be recorded. Good to know um, that this will be on our website. So um, terrific uh, opportunity to keep track of uh, the event. My name is Michelle Salia and I will be your host for this event. Uh, may I ask that all participants please keep your videos off and please turn your mics muted for the duration of the event. Um, I would like to acknowledge firstly our CIMGTA West co-chairs Mary Murray and Phil Cancilla. And on behalf of the CT CIMGTA West, we would also like to offer a huge thanks to our gold sponsors, SGS, for their support. SGS is the world's leading inspection, verification, testing and certification company, recognized as the global benchmark for quality and integrity. SGS provide a comprehensive range of analytical services using their network of state-of-the-art laboratories for a wide range of industries, specifically supporting the mining and metals industry through analytical, bench, scale and pilot plant offerings. Sarah Wilson and Yasha Chaguli, who are both CIM office bearers, will be happy to receive your queries. The details are on the CIM website. And ladies and gentlemen, if your company would like to become a sponsor for the CIM GTA West branch, we would love to hear from you. Before I introduce our speaker today, Glenn Lyle, I'd like to draw your attention to the comments bar on the page. You would see it on the top right hand corner of your screen. And uh, during Glenn's presentation, you'll have the opportunity of typing your questions into this comments bar. At the end of the presentation, Glenn will answer your questions. And please note that you can type your questions in right throughout the Q&A session as well. Glenn is going to be addressing us on an area of major importance in the mining industry today. And we are really thrilled that we have the opportunity of listening to him today. Glenn Lyle is based in Sudbury. He has a BSc and an MSc in mining engineering from Queen's University and Glenn is a professional engineer. During his 33-year career with Vale, formerly INCO, he was involved mainly in engineering, operations and safety. In 2009, Glenn joined SEMI, the Centre for Engineering, sorry, the Centre for Excellence in Mining Innovation, as their Research and Development Director, where he managed collaborative research projects. For the past eight years, Glenn has been a director with Morocco Mining Innovation, a non-for-profit applied research organization, delivering innovative solutions to mining and industry challenges. With Morocco, Glenn works in the field of health, safety and risk management. He is involved with the delivery of the Global Minerals Industry Risk Management Program, the GMIRM, having provided education to over 20 mining companies, including Anglo-American, De Beers, Tech, Glencore and Peabody Energy. In addition to safety risk management facilitation Glenn does for companies, he is also involved in the evaluation and recommendation of health and safety research projects. Glenn is also an extremely active contributor to the CIM. Glenn is the executive director of the CIM Committee for Maintenance, Engineering and Reliability, the MER Society. He is part of the CIM Distinguished Lecturer Program. And probably most exciting, Glenn is the chair of the newly formed CIM Health and Safety Society. Suffice to say that we are in excellent hands this afternoon. So it is my pleasure on behalf of the CIM GTA West to welcome Glenn Lyle. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Michelle. Uh, uh, I hope I live up to your uh, expectations. I see several of the names that I recognize in terms of those that have signed in, so I'm expecting that I'll have some challenging questions at, uh, at the conclusion of uh, my remarks today. Now, okay, come on, slides. Just trying to get the slides to move forward. Oh, there we go. So first of all, I just want to say a very few quick words about Morocco. 
Uh, Morocco is a wholly owned uh, entity of Laurentian University. We run under our own profit and loss statement and our own board of directors. We're currently active in four areas, the mining safety research, which is my area, a geohazard assessment or geotechnical group, a ventilation and production optimization and software side, and an energy side. And those are essentially the four areas that we work on. Now today, what I wanna talk about is first of all, what's been our progress, meaning the mining industry on accident reduction, and how this fits in with what I've seen in terms of the globalization of safety management uh, best practices. Now, if I ask you to consider two things, what has happened in our long-term, our lost time injury frequency over the last two years? And if I ask you what has happened in terms of the fatality frequency over the last 20 years? Now, if we were doing this on a face-to-face, -face, I would try to graph out these two and get a bit of audience participation in terms of the feedback, but unfortunately, under the current circumstances, we can't do that. But I think what we would see is we have had significant reduction in lost time injuries, but we've had less reduction in terms of fatalities within our industry. And I want to explore that a little bit more in our in my discussions and give you my opinion as to why I have seen that occur or why I believe that has occurred. If you look at the ICMM global safety performance, you'll see the same sort of trends. Now 2019, unfortunately, was quite an anomaly with the, uh, the major incident that happened in Brazil. But even if you take those out, you can see that there has been progress, but across the global mining members of the ICMM, and the ICMM membership likely represents about a third of the global workforce and maybe a little more than a third of the major production. So you can imagine that within other mining companies that are not ICMM members, there's still a significant number of mining fatalities that are happening every year. Um, for those of you that are not overly familiar with the ICMM, their website is icmm.org, and I highly recommend that you go in and have a look at some of their, they've got a treasure trove of material in there, and it's all available free of charge. Now, if we look at Ontario, and I don't have the stats in for 2020 in this slide, but I believe there was one fatality that occurred in Ontario during that time period. We have averaged likely one to three fatalities on average over the last 10 years. And again, trending down, but you know, the concern is have we undertaken the right activities to, to sustain this? Because we don't want to see it bump up again. So the other thing to consider in this, and if you look at the stats, in Ontario, on average, there are six times more occupational fatalities than traumatic fatalities. So if you look at the average of the last 10 years, where it says there's been three traumatic fatalities a year, you're looking at roughly 18 occupational fatalities. Now, these are fatalities, occupational fatalities that have been approved and paid out through the WSIB. And they're due to long-term exposure. And as we all know, it's much more difficult to engage employees and your teams in preventing longer-term exposure and longer-term issues. And I certainly look back on, on my career and it was always very difficult to get your health and safety team to recognize that we need to be concerned about long-term exposure and there, there's not that activity, like there's not that interest that we need to, I'm sorry, there is the interest, but it's very difficult to get your employees motivated to try to address long-term exposure and prevention. But from the financial perspective, this certainly represents a large financial liability because ultimately companies will pay in their premiums for 
these occupational illnesses. So it's something that we really need to keep in mind as we're talking about fatalities within the mining industry. It's not just the acute fatalities or traumatic. So why are fatalities still occurring in our industry? First of all, we do work with large energy sources. Now we're not the only ones that work with large energy sources, but the larger the magnitude of the energy, the greater the hazard and the greater the damage it can create to an individual. The other thing, and these are my opinions, but the tools that we've used for other incidents, i.e. prevention of long-term uh, lost time injuries, slips and falls, et cetera, have not been as effective for fatalities. And I think the last piece in this is there's been an over-reliance on behavioral-based safety. We've sort of used it as the go-to, and I think it's caused us a significant amount of, we haven't addressed fatality prevention in the right manner because we've been relying, putting an over-reliance on behavioral. Now, what can be done? Obviously, correct worker behavior is and always will be very important, but you need to have a strong systems approach to risk management to back it up. You can't prevent serious injuries solely on a behavioral-based approach. You need a systems approach to risk management to add into it. The other thing is I think, and I look back and I apologize for the quality of this picture. It was from uh, one that I dragged out of my old work clothes. And so you can see the, the rust on the, on the nails or on the staples from it. But I think we've also had an improper use of the Heinrich pyramid. There's always a relationship between first aid, medical, compensable, and fatal injuries. But I think when certainly my exposure to the Heinrich period but during my career was that there was a very, very strong belief that if we focus on the bottom of the pyramid, the unsafe acts will prevent the fatal injuries. And you know, to the extent that I've heard, I had heard in the past, senior executives within our company that would talk about if we can get the disabling injury frequency down below 0.1, we will not have a fatal incident occur. So there was this very, very strong belief that if you work on the bottom of the pyramid and take the bottom off, you'll get rid of the fatal potential. And I'm saying that that approach has been incorrect and is likely partially responsible for our less progress that we've made on reducing the fatal rate than we have on the lost terms. And I think we've got to turn that completely around. The focus needs to be on the top of the pyramid. You need to search out what can go wrong and what could cause those serious and fatal potential injuries at your workplace. And you search out how to make improvements on those which is through risk assessment, which I'll be talking about in a minute or two. But that whole shift in your philosophy of looking at the top of the pyramid will cause you to improve and change the way that you handle all the others. So I like to look at it as sort of a top-down approach. You focus on the top, you find the big unwanted things that could go wrong, and the tools that you put in place and use for that will show you improvements through the other areas. So if you look at global best practices today that I've seen through many of the companies that I've worked with over the last uh, eight to 10 years, they have a well-defined risk assessment process and standards. They use a four-layer model for risk assessment or a variation on the four-level model. There's a recognition that safety maturity is a journey it's not going to happen overnight. It's a long process. It'll take time and effort. You need to understand the role of controls and control monitoring. And you need to understand the role of critical controls. Now, what we see, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, uh, particularly on critical controls, but it has become somewhat of the buzzword within the industry. Everyone is interested in critical controls. 
but they don't realize that there's a significant amount of work that's required to be able to get to the point where you can actually put a critical control program in place. Now, this is a slide from uh, the state of uh, Queensland in Australia, and it mainly deals with the coal industry that they've had there, but they're talking about their 25 year experience with risk management. Now, I've tried to change around the colors of the lines because they're a little bit uh, deceiving because the red line is actually the number of employees and the blue line is the number of fatalities. I wanted to switch those around, but haven't been able to yet. But the key point out of this is that within the period around uh, 1999 um, and just slightly before, they had a fatality rate of about one in 5,000 within the coal mining industry. They put in the risk assessment work and over the last 25 years, they've improved that to about a one in 30,000. Now that's a very significant change and one that they relate quite strongly to the application and the use of risk management principles in their work. So we know risk management can work. Now the four layer model, and this is taken out of the, the GMERM program or the Anglo program, but you will see this type of approach in many, many different industries. And I'll just briefly go through the four layer. Layer number one, you look across the whole organization and you're looking for those major things that could go wrong. You want to analyze them, you want to document the results, and you want to look to see how you can essentially mitigate their occurrence. Layer number two is really where we're looking at the management of change. What have we found out of layer one that needs further analysis and work? And also, as changes come up, new projects come up, essentially you deal with it in layer number two to assess what impact it will have on your business. Layer number three is to develop safe and effective work and task expectations, standard operating plans, safe operating plans, whatever you're calling them, as well as review the tasks where SOPs have not been available. Now, certainly my experience in the past is many, many procedures were developed, but the procedures weren't really developed on a risk-based platform. You didn't do a risk analysis of what could go wrong with the task and what the controls were to try to prevent or to mitigate what could go wrong and then write the procedure. So I think in a lot of our procedures that we have, there's really a need to go back and to look at them once again through a risk-based lens and see where improvements could be made on it. And finally, in layer number one, and I like to call this an if-then layer, you really want to have everyone stop and think and proceed only with a task when it's safe to do so. Do I have the right equipment? Do I have the right work environment? Am I adequately trained for it? Do I have the right procedures to enact it? If you've got those in place, then it should be acceptable or you should be able to safely complete the work. Now, the key thing about the four layers is they all need to work together. It isn't just one layer that stands on its own. The four need to be worked in conjunction with each other. And so you see in layers number one and two, there's really your opportunity for mostly design and engineering, whereas layers three and four are mainly around the behavior. You've developed the program, you've looked at what could go wrong, you've put the right controls in place, and then in layers three and four, you wanna see them executed as you have designed it. So a common finding in the mining industry, if I go back to this again, four layer approach, that what you have is if you've got weakness in layers number one and two, your risk management transfers significant risk to layer three and behavior becomes the tool that you try to use to prevent all of your unwanted events. And I certainly saw this in with my previous employer in years gone by. Certainly there's, there's been progression on this, but at the time 
we were focused solely on the behaviors of individuals and we weren't looking at the design and the engineering aspects and how we could significantly reduce the hazards in redesigning or re-looking at the task. So that was a huge learning uh, for me. The other part of it is the risk maturity. Now this is a chart out of uh, a simplified piece out of our uh, risk management, um, uh, our risk management training that we do. And really you're moving from accepting that accidents happen, looking to prevent a similar incident, prevent incidents before they occur, tune the incident through ownership, or it becomes the way we do business. Now, many organizations will have some sort of a five-step process. They may call them different names, um, but these are the names that you know, we have essentially adopted in the coursework, and, but it's five steps, and you can't skip the steps, and they take time to complete and it's very easily easy to slip backwards in it. It's not simple to try to change the culture of an organization. And I'm sure many on the call have been involved in activities in the past where you have tried to change the culture of the organization. And there's always been this, we've got to do it right away. And, and most of the time, those fail and fail quite miserably. So the GMERN program that uh, Michelle alluded to at the beginning is looking at really changing the operational risk management through improving understanding, education, and what's the practice of it, and to challenge the way people think. And it's available in, in four different levels from executive to frontline, and I'm involved in that delivery. It was developed at the University of Queensland by Jim Joy, and I'll be talking about Jim in a minute or two. If I'm going into an organization for the first time or trying to talk to someone at an organization about work to be done, I sort of bucket or I try to assess in my own mind where they are in the maturity journey. And so I'll listen for various things in there in the way that they describe their hazards, the risks, et cetera. And the first difference I listen for is do they talk about hazard and risk interchangeably? If they talk about them interchangeably, they're very early on in the safety risk management journey. Because as we know, hazard and risk are not the same. You have a hazard, when you assess that hazard and you develop a risk, the risk has a consequence and a probability or a likelihood of it. But, and certainly I was guilty of this for many years within my, the previous organization I was with, that I saw these as interchangeable terms. They're not, but if you're using them interchangeably, it really means you're early on in the journey. The next stage is really understanding the role of controls. Do we know what they mean? Do we know how they work in terms of controlling or mitigating hazards. And the next wave of it is really in the management of the controls. Once that you understand that they're important, then you need to put into play good methods and methodology to try to control them. So I spoke a little bit earlier about Jim. Um, Jim Joy developed the programs that uh, are part of many mine organizations risk management programs. I've had the pleasure of uh, knowing Jim as a friend and as a cohort for a number of years. I've learned a phenomenal amount from Jim over the years. And in this quote it's saying he really believes and I believe as well that the next phase in managing operational risk is in adequate critical control management. Talked about the ICMM just a little bit earlier. Um, the ICMM.org is their website. And these two documents, the blue one on the left, the Health and Safety Critical Control Management is the Good Practice Guide is an excellent source for discussions on critical control management. And then the brown one, 
or the orange one rather, is on the implementation guide. And they're both excellent presentations. They're available in multiple languages and they're available free to download for those organizations that are not part of the ICMM. And I think currently there's about 27 or 28 global mining companies that are members of the ICMM. A couple of key things that are coming out of the new definitions is that they have refined the definition of controls. And prior to this work, a control was, it really didn't have a defined definition. But now they're breaking it into three pieces. They're saying it's either an act, something you can see a person do, monitor and measure. So training and procedures are not controls. And I'll talk about training and procedures in just a minute. But it's something you can see, do, monitor, measure. Object is a barrier, an engineering device, something that does not require any human intervention. And a system or a technical system is a combination of an object and an act. And I'll give you some examples of these in just a minute. So if we look at the uh, circuit breaker on the left, it's an object. Once it's installed and properly installed, it will work without human intervention. You look at the lockout tagout, that's definitely an act. You would, the individual would either go and put the lock on, isolate, et cetera. Now you look at the technological system and it's somewhat of a, of, of a simple or simplistic um, example, but it's the act of testing and it's using an object like a tester. So it's a simple example of it, but just think that technological system is an act plus an object. So out of these new definitions are definitely some opportunities. So an act, something you can see a person do, monitor or measure, training and procedures are not controls, but what I really think it offers us is the opportunity to review our training and our procedures to ensure that the, desi the desired act is clearly identified. And I think oftentimes if we look back through the training or the procedures, what we wanted the individual to do as a result of the training or as a result of going through the procedure is not all that clear. And I think there's a huge opportunity in going back through our training and our procedures to make it very, very explicit. What is the act that we want the individual to do in this specific situation? So I think there's an opportunity in looking at and embracing these new definitions. So a bit of critical control caution. The success of a critical control program depends very much upon the maturity of the safety maturity of the organization. If the organization is very early on in their safety journey, I don't believe they will have an overly successful critical control program. Not all of the controls that you have are important. I'm sorry, not all of the controls that you have are critical, but all of the controls are important, not just the critical ones. And I think that's a very important distinction and a lot of companies lose sight of it, that they look at the critical control, the list of critical controls and say, oh, okay, um, this unwanted event, let's say it's a collision between a light vehicle and a haul truck. And I know we've got roughly 30 controls that we have identified that would prevent that unwanted event. And we've identified four or five of them as being critical. So there's sort of a relief, oh, well now we only need to have to, to worry about the four or five. And, and that's exactly the wrong tack to take all of them are need to be important. All of them are need to be in play. The critical ones are the ones that give you the sense of, have I got all the other ones 
lined up? Are they looked after? So your critical controls should be looked at as monitoring controls to let you know whether you have your system in, in control or not. The other thing with it is it does require, and the bow tie has become essentially the standard, one of the standard tools used for unwanted events in the mining industry. It's a very, very powerful and very useful tool. It's one of my favorites, but it takes time. I mean, a bow tie analysis of a major unwanted event is likely a four to five day exercise, depending on the complexity of it. So there's a huge time commitment in terms of doing a bow tie, but the results from doing a bow tie are very valuable. So there's a high level of effort and commitment required to do the risk assessment, normally involving the bow tie, establish a control monitoring program, and then look for your critical controls that are part of that. So again, the caution, critical control program must be part of a control management program. And often cases, what I've seen is companies just want to jump in and I want to do critical controls, but they really don't understand that it needs to be nested in a control management program, which is nested in a strong risk management program. This chart is out of the uh, blue ICMM guide. I think it's appendix number one. And it's a maturity chart of trying to give an organization the ability to assess if they're ready for a critical control approach. And I would like to suggest that it's likely the most overlooked piece out of that whole, uh, that whole brochure. And unfortunately, I think it's going to cause a lot of frustration and a lot of failures within the industry where people are trying to jump in and do critical controls when, they're, when their organization is not really ready for it. Now, wrapping up, I just want to introduce you. Uh, Michelle talked about the newly formed CIM Health and Safety Society. Um, our vision is uh, that we would serve as a national center to support and promote mining health and safety excellence, benefiting Canadian mining professionals. So we want to contribute to the improvement of health and safety well-being. We want to be the organization of choice and we want to collaborate and work with other CIM societies to achieve the goal of zero harm. So the invitation to you as a newly formed society, we're developing our strategy and our action plans. We'd like to reach out to other societies to become part and to contribute to the development of our strategy. And we welcome your thoughts and suggestions. Now, I, I'm the current chair of this uh, organization and Brian Wilson, is the current secretary for our organization. So I would really welcome you to uh, contact us and uh, find out more about the organization and how we can help each other. Now, last but not, not least, sort of a bit of a reminder, controls definitely need to be related to the hazard. And I, I like a, a joke every now and again. And when I saw this one about the uh, the angel of death or whatever you wish to call him carrying the these people across the river sticks to Hades I thought the comment about the life vest requirement surprised me uh, sometimes we get over wrapped up with our controls and we put controls in where we may not require them as much as we thought so thank you very much for your attention I will, and I understand the way that we're working the questions is that uh, Michelle is sort of handling them and I will attempt to answer them. So I think. Thank you to... very much, Glenn. Um, I think people were so focused on your excellent presentation that they forgot that they had to write uh, any questions uh, in the little comments box. So, so please, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, as you reflect on um, what Glenn has been sharing with us today, please uh, 
put uh, any uh, questions that you have in here. Uh, we've got a tremendous uh, contribution here from Roy Slack who says, Glenn, great presentation. I totally agree with the misconception you point out regarding the pyramid. I would also agree that the meaningful CRM program is a big job, but a necessary one. Many contractors have worked on this and some have a very good program. As a contractor, part of the challenge is that even though your overall program is strong, you do carry out short term pro projects and often with local personnel who may not have been involved in the program development. It creates a steep learning curve. Any advice on the CRM from a project as opposed to an operating mind perspective? Thanks for that question, Roy. Yeah, uh, Roy, very good question. And uh, I thank you for, for submitting it. Um, I think that's always a challenge. And, and we've talked about this in the past as well. And I, under, I know that sometimes a contractor goes in and their safety maturity may be higher than that of the organization that they're working with. So the adoption of what are the requirements at the site, always a challenge. But I think once you've established your program and put it together, and when it's explained to the individual or to the company that you're working with, I think it should mesh more easily. So I think it would, I think it would just take more time up front to describe the program, describe what you were looking at doing to the organization and see how you would best fit in. Thank you, Glenn. While, while people are busy uh, writing their questions in, um, you've spoken, Glenn, about uh, the importance of a strong risk management program. Kind of that's the foundation that you would build off in terms of getting towards a program of of moving towards uh, a culture where you'd be implementing stronger controls and control effectiveness. Um, could you share with us how one would go about uh, implementing a risk management program uh, given your involvement on the GMIRM side and uh, your experience on this? Thanks, uh, Glenn. Yeah, certainly. I, I absolutely agree that it's a foundation. And in fact, I ended up giving a Minerva uh, discussion yesterday, and it was on the management of change. And the, the thing that I was emphasizing in that is that you cannot have a strong management of change program unless you've got a strong risk assessment program to back it up. Um, so there's so many advantages in developing a strong risk assessment program. It's very, it's a great one to develop buy-in and understanding from the workforce. I don't think I've been in a case yet where, even though sometimes um, the workers were brought in and they're very grudgingly involved in, oh, okay, we got to do a risk assessment, and you can tell their enthusiasm is not high. But at the end of it, having explained what the process is, how to go through it, what are the steps that are required in it, we were always able to turn them around to supporters of, oh yeah, I'd like to be involved in this again. I see how this would work. So I think in terms of introducing it, Michelle, you, you need to start with an understanding of the executive team. They need to know how big of a bite they're taking with this. What's involved in it? How long is it going to take? What are the resources? Because oftentimes, executives want to snap their fingers and say, okay, it'll be done tomorrow. Well, not really the case. It's going to take some time and it's going to take some buy-in. So you need to start with the executive level to explain what's involved, how it goes through. Then you need to train some individuals on how to do proper risk assessments and give them some support in terms of how it's starting out. And you would need to set the priority list of what are you going to risk assessment first? 
And that's again, where you can bring back in the executive team and find out where do they think that they have the greatest hazards or the greatest risks, or in other words, what causes them to lose sleep overnight. And look at those items first, and then work down through the lesser priority events, the operation. So hope that answers your question, Michelle. Thank you very much, Glenn. Um, our next question is from Carlos, who says, good stuff, thank you. He asks it, or she asks, in what category are things such as underground signage, for example, open hole, et cetera, control or technical process? <laughs> Good question. I, I would say that they, I wouldn't call them an object. I would call them an act um, because they're requiring someone to do something from reading them. And and as we know, they're very low in the hierarchy of controls. Because we as humans make mistakes. We didn't read it. We didn't see the sign. We might have ignored it. Thank you, Glenn. Our next question is from Brian Edwards, who says, Glenn, have you had the opportunity to review and provide comments to a new book published last year by Superior Glove that evaluates the myths, tr truths, and proven practices of safety in industry with an emphasis on hand safety. You would uh, like your comments on their findings and recommendations at looking at the many companies' practices and how they should be applied. Okay, so I apologize, I've not seen the book, uh, so I really can't comment on it, but what I would, like is if Brian could send me some of the, the details on the book and I'll try to look it up and uh, have a review of it. Thanks very much, Glenn. We, we appreciate that. Um, Michael Winship says it's an excellent presentation and he agrees with your thoughts. He would add that in a turnaround situation or M&A, you often encounter a weak safety maturity. He says in his experience, he's found that behavioral based safety approach can be quite successful in quickly bringing down accident rates. It's not sustainable for the long term and you have to follow up with the tough work of systems and controls, as you explained. I think it was a. And, and, and I think I would tend to agree with that, that if you're if you're starting off from a very low point. Um, making sure that the proper behaviors are in place is very important. And as Michael points out in the note, it's not sustainable. And I, I would suggest that um, as you're looking to try to enforce or implement more of a behavioral core approach to couple that with a good understanding of risk assessment. and I think that would help move you along quicker than just focusing on the behaviors. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, Michael has an additional question. He says it's unrelated, but hey, it's, it's risk related. So he wants to know if you have a sense as to how the Canadian mining industry has done in dealing with the COVID pandemic risk. You know, I, I think they've done exceedingly well. Now, I had the, the pleasure of doing some work with the Ontario Mining Association, and we came up with a collaborative, um, essentially it was a modified bow tie format of what many of the OMA members had been doing for um, the virus. And I think on the whole, they have been very successful in it. There, there have been outbreaks there have been unfortunate occurrences i think there was a there have been some deaths as well related to it but when you look at the number of mines that have been operating and the fact that many of them have been operating under these conditions for close to a year now and many of them started from you know a, a full stop and came up and developed um, their procedures and sharing the procedures, et cetera, I, I think they've done an excellent job. And I think there's a lot of things that other industries can learn 
from the way that the mining industry has approached it. And any member, any certainly any company that's a member of the OMA um, has access to this collaborative report that we put together. And they've also given us permission to circulate the report to the Mining Association of Canada, to the ICMM, and to the Mining Safety Roundtable. And what we're still looking at doing is collecting uh, the experiences and the controls that companies have put in place. Now it's changing a little bit now from how do we manage it at the site to now how do we improve our tracking and uh, follow up on it. And when I was talking to the gentleman from ICMM the other day, it was moving now into more of a, okay, some of our operations now have vaccines in place. How do we progressively and systematically start to reduce some of the procedures that we put in place. So I think the mining industry has led in many areas. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Glenn. I think the important thing is that um, ultimately we need to see all of the mining fatalities um, reduced and eliminated and um, a good risk-based approach, critical controls, all the things that you've spoken about are available, the expertise, the resources through yourself, Morocco, are available and we can all uh, contribute in a meaningful way towards this. The CIM is a society, your new um, uh, society, Glenn, all of these things are moving towards that and um, thank you so much for for the critical, important message that you've given us um, today. We appreciate uh, you joining us. Thank you so much, Glenn. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And I, my email was on the, the slides. Uh, Michelle, I will send you the slide deck so they're available. And I welcome any discussions, any further discussions. Thank you very much, Glenn. And the great news, everyone, is that the talk is uh, on the website. It has been recorded, so you can have the pleasure of watching it again as you're at your leisure and, and sharing it with colleagues. Uh, please, this is amazing.